So I'm going to talk you all through uh, a couple of examples of what we're doing. Um, essentially using, broadly speaking, what you might be doing for a, a desk-based assessment. And then I'll talk through how you can use GIS to inform uh, post-excavation um, interpretation and things like that. Um, I do think that QGIS can be used by pretty much anybody in archaeology. It will have some utility for what you're doing. Um, so sorry if this doesn't quite focus on what you would be using it for, but hopefully it will be transferable enough. So we've got our QGIS open and I'm just going to check that we are on British National Grid. So that is one way to check it is down here. Uh, and then we want to load our data. So we're going to load um, our uh, proposed development area. Uh, so this is one way to add a bit of vector information is layer, add layer, add vector layer. And what I'm going to be bringing in is a polygon. So we've got our shape file. So you can see in this folder, this is the data that um, you're likely to get from your surveyors or from your clients or, or whoever. And you can see that there, there are quite a few different file types, but they, there's like four of each name. So the SHP is the, the shape file, which is the one that you really want to be using and loading in. But the other stuff is metadata to do with your shape file. So you don't have to worry about it. You just have to make sure that if you're ever sending anybody this information, please send them the shape file and all of the metadata because it has information about the attributes about the projection, about the sort of like indexing for the data and stuff like that. So it might even help if you want to put everything in a fold, its own folder so that each, each bit of information has its own folder with all of the metadata in and then you can zip it and you can send it to people and it doesn't get separated um, and then it will work and everyone's happy. But what you're loading in is the SHP, the shape file, and then it will kind of infer the rest of it for you. So I'm going to leave it on all of the defaults and click add and close. So this is our PDA. Um, this little thing here says is basically saying it's not quite sure which projection we're using. So I'll just click on that and make sure we're on British National Grid. So that doesn't tell us much yet. Um, the power really is about uh, when you're superimposing it with other information. So you can have um, OpenStreetMap as a base map if you want, but I like to use the Ordnance Survey, um, I think it's called Open Map Local. First, I'm going to show you how you can style this piece of information. So what's quite important to note is here, these layers, that those are the data that you have. Um, and then when you style the data, you're not changing the shape file. So the shape file is the same if anybody else wants to use it. So maybe you have it on a server and other people are going to be using that data as well. You're not necessarily changing the shape file itself. With the symbology, what you're doing is changing how it appears in your project. So if you right click up here, you can see all the options for the panels. Don't be intimidated. A lot of them I don't use, frankly, but the one that I really want is layer styling. I always have this one open. However, you, you can get into this another way and I'll show you in a minute. So styling here, because this is a polygon, which is a closed shape, that means that it can have a fill color. So it's a simple fill. But in this instance, I actually don't want it filled because I want to see what's going on inside. So I'm going to change the fill style to no brush. And just, I like to have the consistency here, have a red line for our red line, the PDA. So that's a simple, simple example of styling. And then I'm going to bring in the ordnance survey data. So again, I'm going to go into oh, no, layer, 
add layer, add vector layer. And you can download this stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, Open Map Local, that's what it's called. <laughs> Uh, you can download this all from the Ordnance Survey website and this data is free. So just as an example, what I like to do is sort the files by type so that all of the SHPs are together so I don't accidentally try to load in the metadata. And then I'm going to select which ones I want. So I'll usually go for building, um, named place. Oh, I'm holding control so I can select several at once. Um, railroad track, road, surface water area, surface water line. I'll discuss that in a minute. Tidal water, you know, the, these bits I like to bring in. So then I can, I can load several at once quite easily like this. And then as you can see, it has automatically styled everything in pretty random colors. Um, and that's not really what I want. So I'm just going to bring that bit of information up to the top and then I'm going to hold shift and select all of these things and then right click. And then what I can do is group selected. So this is quite good because then you can turn it all on and off in one go. And I'm going to save this project because QGIS quite likes to crash. Unfortunately, so does ArcGIS. So sorry about that, everyone. Can't stress that enough. Save your project. Yeah, genuinely. Give it a second. That, that's another thing to learn about QGIS is sometimes if your computer isn't powerful. Give it a second. OK. So our buildings are a simple fill, much like our automatic um, LOE was. Um, and that is also a polygon. But named place is an example of, I'm just gonna zoom in and see if I can get some of these points showing up. This is an example of point data. So Phoebe mentioned the polygons, lines, and points as the main forms of vector data. Um, so named place, when you bring it in from the Ordnance Survey, the, the points aren't actually that interesting in and of themselves. What you really want is the labels. So instead of having a single symbol, oh, that's, that's interesting, I guess, we can go into the labels of layer styling and we can go single labels. Uh, we would probably give it HTML name, I think is the one that I usually go for. So we've got the River Ivor, and you can see down here, we've got Hill Farm House and things like that. So as an example, I would actually probably turn the symbols off. And then we have our text labels and you can change the styles. So you can have it, yep. Yeah, Aerial, maybe have it a bit smaller. You can make it bold if you want. You can make it a different color. And then what I quite like is the text buffer, which gives it a little bit of white kind of behind it. So you can see it's um, standing out on top of the things. So that, you know, you can actually read it. Um, and the railway track, um, what sh is there one here? Oh yeah, there you go, there it is. That's an example of line data. So we don't have a fill automatically. We just simple line. I like to have that as like a, a black line that's quite thick to make it stand out. So that's quite good. And then the roads, um, we have um, different types of roads and they're all on the same layer, but thankfully, in the attributes, we have loads of information about them. So just to show you the attributes, you can get it from this little symbol here, or you can right click and go open attribute table. And so this brings up our metadata in a handy table like this. So you can see the kind of data that you're dealing with. And so we have the names of the roads, but we also have the classifications of the roads. Now, that's useful for when we're styling it because, yeah, we might want the labels. It depends on, you know, what your project demands. You... 
Uh, yes, I think it was disc name, wasn't it? But you can also style with not just a simple line or with a single symbol. You can also classify the information. So this is what we're going to use later as well when we are phasing our site. But just to show you an example, we're going to go categorized. And so it isn't all the same color, it's categorized. And then we choose what we want to categorize it by. So under value, we would put the ooh, classification, classifica, because there isn't enough space. <laughs> and then we click classify here and it gives us all of the types of roads, all of them in that layer. So we can go through and we can give them different colors. We can give them different um, thicknesses or line weights. But with the OS data, I would imagine you don't want to do this every single time. So what you can do is you can right click and go to properties. And then we can use symbology here and then we can load a style. So you may have set this up and saved this as a style. You can now load the style. So I have this um, style sheets, road, load style. Okay. And there you go. Now it styles it how I like it. And you can you can make and save your styles and you can have it as your own thing. You can share it with your team on the server, you know, that sort of thing. So you can get consistency. So I'm going to do the same thing with these ones. So symbology, load style. We were looking at surface water area. Mm -hmm. And if you're really techy, you can like I did, <laughs> write a script to do this stuff automatically because it can be quite laborious. Um, if you're keen, learn a bit of Python because that's what it runs on. But if that doesn't make any sense to you, also don't worry about it. <laughs> I try to call all, all of my styles exactly the same thing so I don't get mixed up. Um, and then the buildings I'll load as well. You can see also there's the save style option there, but I haven't got any styles that I like at the moment, so that's why I'm loading them. There, so now that looks um, bland, but, and, and you can see that the labels render differently depending on your level of zoom. Um, so you can go, oh God, where are the road names? But if you zoom in, they will render. And you can change those settings as well if you want. So I'm going to save. Uh, so one of the first things that we might be looking at in a desk space assessment would be the listed buildings in the area. And that is something that is open data that you can download. I'd imagine you would probably also want um, HER data if you're doing a desk-based assessment, which you usually need to apply for. So I'm not, I'm not demonstrating that data because it's not open, but I will show you the listed buildings because that is open downloadable data anyone can download. And it's the same with the scheduled ancient monuments. You can just download them. So I'm going to go back to my area here. Oh, and then I'm going to load the listed buildings. So again, we want the SHP, the shape file. Open that. Oh, and it's helpfully put it in the folder. I don't uh, the group. I don't want it there. I want it here. Uh, and it will render. There you go. So you can see these pink dots. So again, you can, you can change the symbology, you can add the labels, but you also might want to just know, okay, well, how many lists of buildings are there within a kilometer of my site? So this is where it gets pretty handy. We can create a buffer zone from our site. So this layer, our LOE, sorry, is a limit of excavation because I'm using something that has now been excavated. But at this point, it would probably be proposed development area, wouldn't it? PDA. Um, we can create a one kilometer buffer zone and then we can clip the other data to that buffer zone. So 
before I do that, I'm just going to do a quick. Oh, no, not that. That's a bit too complicated. <laughs> so we can have the name. Um, I think with the listed buildings, you may well want list entry. And so you can see that. Cool. OK. So we select the layer that we want to create the buffer from and we go vector geoprocessing tools buffer. You don't have to remember this off heart. People on the forums are very helpful at describing how to do things. So our input layer is our LOE and then I'll put a thousand meters and then the segments is kind of how it sort of renders the shape. I'll just put in a high-ish number so that it isn't really, really jagged. Run flows. And now we have our shape. I'll move it underneath. And I will, again, change it so that it doesn't have a fill colour so we can see it. And I like to change it to red. And then you can also change it so that instead of a solid line, it's a dashed line. So we can see this is our buffer zone. And then we can flip the listed building layer to this. And then what that does is, so this is a new bit of information that we've just created. Then when we clip the other layer, it doesn't delete the other stuff. It makes a new shape file, which is just the information that is within the zone. So you're not ruining anyone else's project if they're also using the same file. So I'll click the one that I'm talking about and we go vector geoprocessing tools clip. So the input layer is the one that we want to clip, the listed buildings, and the overlay layer is the buffered that's what it's called there. Um, so here, just to explain quickly, the default is to create a temporary layer. So sometimes you may want to make a layer that is temporarily useful as a means to an end, but you don't necessarily need to save it as data. You don't, you don't need it after you've used it. But this one, we probably do want to keep it. So instead of saving it as a temporary layer, we save it to file, so then we have the file that we wanted. Listed buildings, there we go. Run, close. Okay, so now you can see that it's loaded another one in. I'm just going to turn the background mapping off for a second so you can see it easier. Uh, and it's a different colour. So one of the handy things is you don't necessarily have to save your style sheets externally and everything. You can copy them from within the project. So maybe I did want them to be pink. So I can go right click, styles, copy style, all style categories. So we're not copying just one element of it. I'm just going to turn that off because I'm not interested. And then right click, styles paste style all style categories and there we go. Now you might want to have your listed buildings um, to have different colours according to different categories. Um, for example, the phase. We can open our attribute table and we can look at all the information about them. Yep, phasing information, it doesn't exist yet so we can make it. So this is where you are changing your shapefile because you're changing things in the attribute table. But that's okay because we've made a new shapefile here, so it's ours, so we can do what we like with it. By default, editing is switched off, which is excellent, so you don't accidentally do things all the time. But we do want to do something now, so we deliberately turn on editing, toggle editing mode. And the information that we want to separate it by will be, you know, rough period. So we can go new field which is a new column uh, and let's say period put a comment if you want be careful about the type because it's very easy to just automatically go blah 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 yeah 
and then it's still set on integer and actually you want to write words in. So that's, yeah. So we want a text string and then we want to, this is probably overkill, but just in case you ever needed to write a lot in, you can say 200 characters max, okay. And then as we go along here, we can see, yeah, null, we haven't got any information. Let's imagine that this one is medieval. No, that's not how you spell it, sorry. I can't spell when people are watching. Do you find that? Uh, post medieval, let's say that one's modern. That one's modern. And then we save. And then very importantly, turn off editing again. And now we have the categories that we want. So we can go layer styling, categorized, categorized by period, classify, ta-da. So this is very useful when you have a lot of points. So for example, HER data, you might have flipping loads of the things and you go, well, I only want to look at the modern. Oh, and oh, that, that one didn't get a thing. <laughs> I only want to look at the modern. You can turn it on and off here. You can turn it on and off here. Um, and then you may also be interested in the scheduled monuments. So instead of having to look at physical maps or anything, you can load that information in. So we'll go layer, add layer, add vector layer. Okay, so as I zoom out, you can see, yeah, there are some scheduled monuments in the region. You know, there's nothing in the buffer zone, but we still might want to know about this one. So we could open the attribute table and try to find it, but helpfully we have our little identify tool here. So we can click on that, we can click on the thing we want to look at, and then we've got all the information. So we know, okay, Home Mill Iron Bridge, that's the one that's there, fab. And the other bit of open information, which, uh, sorry, open data that Phoebe mentioned was the LiDAR data that you can download from the DEFRA website. Now this is different because this is, I'm just gonna click away so it doesn't keep being read. Um, instead, this has all been vector data. So we're gonna load in some raster data. I'm gonna save because it's quite big. Uh, so I've saved a couple of tiles already, but Downloading it from the DEFRA website is very easy um, because they have a kind of web map that you can zoom into and you can draw your little shape of your site or per area of interest. Then it will tell you which tiles are available. So add raster layer this time. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the file name sort of convention. So just a comment is DTM is a digital terrain model, um, which usually you'll want rather than the DEM, which is the digital elevation model. So the reason for that is that the elevation model has all the vegetation and the buildings and things like that, whereas the terrain model, they've tried to strip that out so that you actually get the land, essentially, well, and the, yeah, where the water is and things like that, um, which is more helpful from an archaeological perspective because we're probably interested in the land rather than the built environment and amount of trees. You might be interested in that for something else, but th in this example, and then TIFF, is the one you want to load but it is a geo-referenced TIFF it's a TIFF with spatial information about it okay that was that one and that was the NE and I'll just load the other one so you can see that we have um, a gradient showing so the lowest is the black and the highest is the white, I think that's right. But because these are two different tiles, unfortunately they've come in slightly differently. So there are a couple of ways you can address this. You can manually set them to the same minimum and maximum values, or 
you can merge them into one file. So maybe you want to load it repeatedly or you want your colleagues to be able to use it and not have to deal with this. You go raster, miscellaneous, merge. Uh, and then we select the layers that we wanted, these two. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of the identify results bit here. I don't really need that. So you can change this to um, crazy colors if you want. Yes, palleted. Classify. Oh, OK. Uh, you want. There we go. Yes. So, yeah, you can you can set the sort of values manually here where you can set the minimum and the maximum. So let's say 20 and 70 and then this one. Oh, that one's got a higher maximum. So let's change it to 76 on both of them. 76. And then there you go. Now they match up. Uh, so you can tweak the ways that you want to uh, display it um, to accentuate bits of it and not other bits of it. So you might actually not really be interested in the stuff that's showing up very light over here, for example, and you're really actually interested in this bit. So you can set the minimum and maximum manually to kind of alter how you want to do it. And as long as your output specifies the minimum and the maximum that you set, um, that means that the information will be um, illuminating. Uh, so I'm going to put both of those below the... So that's our information. I'm going to change those labels to... White. There you go. And then it, we can, you know, output this to a different layer if we want and, or give it a label or whatever, but that might just be not even necessarily in your graphics or in your report. You might just want to mention it, for example, but you can always find the information here. Let's get rid of that one. There you go. Uh, so this is the broad strokes of a uh, desk based assessment. Um, you can also export the uh, information that you created into a spreadsheet. So let's say with your clipped listed buildings, you're looking at your attribute table. You know, we, we create, oh, that didn't go in, did it? It's modern. There we go. You could have created that information here, but you can also open it um, if you find the DBF, you can open that bit of metadata in... You can find where you saved it by going into properties. You can change the file type, I think we can see it. Information. Yeah, that might be the issue. Yeah, it said all Excel files, but yeah, if I go all files... Yeah, you're right, that was it. Right, the DBF you can open in a spreadsheet format and you don't want to change anything here, but you can view it. So you can see it's on the end there. And then you can save that as an Excel spreadsheet or you can save it as what will become relevant later, a CSV, which is a comma separated value.